A very good evening and warm welcome to Dan Really Likes Wine, brought to you by Pick and Pay. And first of all, a huge, huge thank you to the Shannon Blanc Association for what was a lovely session a little earlier on today. If you missed it, it's still up online, both on our channels and the Shannon Blanc Association channels. The crux of it, we announced the top 10, the Standard Bank Shannon Blanc Top 10 Challenge, uh, together with uh, Tinashi Nyamudoka, who read out our top 10 winners, former sommelier at the Test Kitchen, now looking after the Kumusha wine brand, his own wine brand up here in Johannesburg. Ken Forrester giving us a rousing tribute to Shannon Blanc and the leading role it is playing in South African wine at the moment. We also had James from Wine Cellar, who was the chief judge, giving us an introduction. And Billy Duplessis from Standard Bank, the very proud sponsors uh, together, it made for a lovely hour or thereabouts discussing the merits of Shannon Blanc, of which there are plenty and celebrating those 10. And a particular well done to Alvi's Drift and to Stellenrust, who each got two wines into that top 10. So today is a good day to be raising a glass of Chenin Blanc to all of our winners. But it's also a good day to be getting some Syrah, some Shiraz ready, because we have got a fabulous competition as we lead in over the course of the next week to National Heritage Day and the chance to celebrate your heritage, whatever it might be here in South Africa, in the way that you deem fit. And we thought what we'd do is we'd hook up with one of South Africa's favorite chefs and one of South Africa's favorite wine brands and try out some steak and Syrah. Great combination. And I think for many South Africans, whether it's over the braai or in a chisanyama, there will be a steak or two going down on the 24th of September as we celebrate this maddening, infuriating, wonderful country of ours that makes us smile one moment and batter our head against a wall in frustration the next. Uh, but overall, just has so much going for it. And it's uh, those great attributes that keep us hoping that the future will be a little bit more positive. Uh, it'll be so with plenty of wine. And we've got some terrific wine today, not just some Syrah, but also some bubbles. And so it's a good moment to say hello to our guests, both of whom are familiar faces to viewers of Dan Really Likes Wine. They've both been with us over the course of the uh, the last few months. Uh, the first of them is the man behind Antony Rupert Vayner. He uh, runs the marketing, I think, mostly just tastes vast amounts of wine. I don't think he actually does anything else other than taste lots of wine and appear on high profile shows and do what his wife Dariel tells him to around the house. The other is one of our great chefs, except he's not really because other people do all the cooking. He just plays golf all day. Together, they're great mates to mine and two fabulous South Africans. Ahead of Heritage Day next week, we say a big hello to Gareth Robertson and to Ruben Riffle. Gentlemen, Good afternoon, good evening, a very warm welcome. Lovely to see you both. It's great to be in this room and a great meet to be back today and just met the point. Dan, good to see you. All right, I think we might need to just double check your connection there, guys. We're getting uh, not much sound and some very uh, pixelated images. Uh, so uh, I'll let uh, I'll let Ronaldo uh, talk you out and communicate with you for a moment and see if we can, uh, can get that Wi-Fi signal up a little stronger. While that happens, and we've got to get it done, sorry, any guests today, uh, but to tell you why we have got Ruben and Gareth on, it's a few reasons, it's to try uh, two wines. We're going to be trying some bubbles, and I think celebration with bubbles is something to do every time there's an occasion of consequence, and National Heritage Day is certainly an occasion of consequence. So we'll be trying some of the Brut Classique in just a moment. And then the headline act for today, wine-wise, and that would be this, the uh, Syrah from Ribex Rafir out of the Swartland. It's part of the Cape of Good Hope range, which in turn sits under the Antony Rupert stable. And that will be running alongside of our steak, which will be prepared by Ruben. So he'll give us the expert's guide to doing a steak. Uh, and a steak is something that seems so simple, but I'm sure you don't have to look too far back to remember somebody giving you a steak that was far less than what you had been hoping for. So we'll get some tips from Ruben, but also find out from him just why our Syrah and our steak make such natural companions. We also, though, have got a really cool prize. And this is thanks to Gareth and the team at Antony Rupert Vayner. We have got not one, not two, not three, but four, four cases of the Cape of Good Hope Ribex Rafia Syrah. And we'll be giving out one of them to four different winners 
And all you'll have to do when that competition comes about, there you go, there are the details. Uh, you just need to be following both Dan Really Likes Wine and Antoni Rupert Drainer on either Facebook or Twitter, ideally both. And when you have done that, uh, just post your photo of your steak and Syrah or your steak and Shiraz combination and use the hashtag steak and Syrah and we'll announce our winners this time next week, National Heritage Day, your chance to win a fabulous case of great Swartland wine under the Cape of Good Hope label. So there we go. We'll give you a post and update you on that through the course of the show, and it'll be up on our social media channels as well. So that is to look forward to four cases of the Cape of Good Hope, Rubik's Lafayette Syrah, but Dan really likes wine, and Antony Rupert Vayner. Okay, let's uh, see if we can go back to Casa Riffle and see if Reuben and Gareth have got a slightly better connection. It's mostly down to Reuben downloading all sorts of videos. He shouldn't be downloading once his wife's gone to bed. <laughs> uh, there we go. Uh, is, uh, is, uh, how are we going there, guys? Can you hear me all right? No, we've got a frozen Gareth and we have got a frozen Reuben. So we're not winning there with our internet connection, which is a little strange because 10 minutes ago before we went live, they were working absolutely perfectly. So we'll, uh, we'll give them a moment or two uh, and see if we can have one last crack at getting them online. Uh, in the interim, I shall uh, try out the first of the wines and that beautiful toasty nose of Mm. Some Lomar Brut, good way to start the late afternoon and a, a good way to, to celebrate and toast once again those Chenin Blanc winners. And if you didn't see them earlier on today, uh, just a reminder that we have got uh, uh, got them up on the website. That's shenan.co.za. Uh, so, right, I think uh, I think we might have uh, – they're out at the braai now, so let's see if we can get the guys out at the braai where they're going to be doing their steak and have a third crack at Reuben and at Gareth. Uh, yes, that's working a little better. Gentlemen, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I can hear you, Dan. Uh, I have to admit, this is largely my fault, Gareth, because when you did send me a, a please call me and an attached message saying run out of data, I thought you were just joking. <laughs> but, uh, it's been a tough, tough winter for our restaurants and our wine farm, so understandable. Welcome to you both. It's lovely to have you back on the show. And uh, thank you both for joining us. Uh, we've got some of the bubbles to uh, to raise a glass to. So uh, cheers to you both. And uh, uh, lovely to see you both. It's uh, an important week ahead. We've got the National Heritage Day uh, coming up. Uh, it's a day where we celebrate our, our respective heritage. So let's get an idea from the two of you. Uh, Ruben, for, in terms of heritage, we know you're, uh, you're French first and foremost, uh, followed by South African, uh, followed by partly Scottish from the sheer amount of time you spent in bunkers on Scottish <laughs> <laughs> what does uh, Heritage Day mean to you? And uh, before we get into the steak and syrup, what other wine, what other food speaks to you about the Reuben Riffle heritage? Well, then for me, um, heritage have to obviously include sort of my family, um, kind of where I come from. You know, I think the great thing is that uh, if you can sort of acknowledge and uh, you're clear in terms of where you come from, um, that is that is an important heritage, especially for in terms of going forward. And I and food, food plays such a big role in that, you know. So whether it's spending time with family, um, look, I didn't grow up uh, in a family where quality wine was sort of um, <laughs> sort of a high up on the priority list. It was really just about quality sort of food, and whatever sort of uh, makes you drunk is okay. But uh, nowadays, obviously. It's nice to celebrate with good quality wine, um, good product, good food. But the important thing is to be able to share that with the people that's closest to you, whether it's family or friends. Um, and yeah, I think it's such a special day because it allows us to think again. And every year there's something new and something different that you remember. Um, and these little sort of uh, golden uh, sort of uh, moments that whether it's a family member that shares it with you that you can sort of maybe take forward or share with your family, you know? So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's brighter, you know, it's, it's, uh, because we, we sort of, uh, bond over Briar, I suppose, you know, um, 
Uh, and it doesn't matter how many people are on, the more the merrier. And I, I love that about sort of South Africa, especially. I think that's quite unique to us. It's a, a wonderful aspect of being South African. We do have this fabulously mixed heritage in every sense and so many different strands to pull in and, and weave together in terms of, of who we are. How does that fit with the Robertson clan? I know that uh, you've got some, some Maritzburg blood in you and some Kwasili Natal blood, uh, Gareth. <laughs> Mary, probably the most influential woman in the South African wine industry and Darielle. Uh, what, what does that heritage mean to the Robertson family? Yeah, I definitely think it's um, first and foremost is really about family and getting people around um, and um, having a great day. I think Heritage Day for us is, is definitely going to be bring, behind the fire um, and um, making and putting a decent uh, piece of meat and uh, definitely some steak um, will be there um, and some good wine and um, some good family and friends around um, to celebrate the Heritage um, Day for us. <laughs> Sounds like a very, very appealing day to be part of. And shortly, I'll be putting up Gareth's home address on screen if you'd like to go and join him with your family. He'd love <laughs> to see you all around. Uh, big, big, big theme of today. Where there, there'll be different things that people are doing on Heritage Day. Uh, I was born in Northern Ireland. Uh, my wife is Greek. And we live very proudly and happily in South Africa. And so I'll have a, a big Greek leg of lamb and a beef and Guinness pie in the oven with South African wine to wash it all down. Yeah, but for many people, and we uh, alluded to the start of the show, it's a fire, it's a grill, it's a steak. And I know the big drive for Heritage Day is steak and Syrah, the Antony Vena stable. And uh, we're going to climb into some of that Syrah in just a moment. But it's also a day for celebration, Gareth. And we've got the wine that is synonymous with celebration here, which is Bubbles uh, and Cap Classique. And it, it's not a conversation that's new to the two of us, but it's one that's, I think, worth reinforcing, particularly in light of who I've got on the show next week. And you're going to have to wait till the end to find out who that is. But the, the Cup Classique industry in South Africa, the, the way we make Cup Classique, the, uh, the tribute, the, the reward we give to, to the grapes that we use, we really are creating something incredibly special in terms of effervescent wine here in South Africa. <laughs> Yeah, damn, definitely. I think um, there's some amazing um, Cup Classics and in, in, being produced in South Africa. Um, you know, it's it's really growing. Um, we can see the sparkling wine and especially um, Cup Classic market growing in South Africa. And we've definitely seen it um, in our sales of Lomara. And um, currently we do four um, um, Method Cup Classics. Um, we do uh, two non-vintage, a Brut Classic and a Brut Classic Rosé. So yeah, we are toast with the Lombrons Brut Classique. Um, and then we've got a vintage Blanc de Blanc and then um, also a vintage Rosé. Um, and I think, you know, South Africa has come a long way with um, producing great Cup Classique. I think guys like Peter Ferreira and um, the guys at Colmont and Le Lude, and there are just so many to name that have actually just raised the bar. And, and there's some small producers and some big producers. I think, um, just looking at the turnout of what happened um, at, at the last um, Champagne and Cup Classique festivals, just how many people are interested in and actually coming out and enjoying themselves. I'm not too sure if it's going to be happening this year, but hopefully it is. Um, and I, yeah, I'm very bullish about the, the category in South Africa and um, internationally. It's definitely, we've, I've been speaking to some of my colleagues um, in the industry and they're also seeing um, an increase in that. And personally, I think it can rival the, some great champagnes um, at much better value. I think you might be on mute. Yeah, you're on mute. Oh, there we go. Have we got you back? Yeah, you're on mute there. Sorry. <laughs> that was a, uh, I, I was saying there, Reuben, the, uh, I know when you were at the one and only, when you had your restaurant there, there was a rider that you had whereby in your suite, which was roughly the size of a tennis court, you had to have a bathtub full of vintage Dom Perignon at all times. <laughs> uh, but, but all you'd actually go drink was Cup Classique. And uh, I think for, the, for those of us who've traveled, uh, and, uh, and gone around the world and drunk not just your standard Mousse and Chandon or Veuve Clicquot, the brands we see a lot of here in South Africa, but generally champagne out of the top houses in France, when compared with the very best of what we have in South Africa, uh, we can be pretty proud of what we produce here. 
I think it's then it's um, look. I, I, I like bubbly, and I've got a lot of friends that really enjoy it. I, I mean, I'm I'm very happy to say that we're going into spring and summer now, the best time to enjoy it. And um, yeah, look, I mean, grow kind of growing up in this industry in in the hospitality industry over the years. Uh, you can also see that um, you know that pattern from before, where a lot of your customers would come and they would order a, a French champagne. Nowadays, you know, because of that that value again that Gareth just sort of touched on, and 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 the quality, um, people are more than happy. And I'm not talking about locals only. I'm talking about uh, you know people that come from abroad, um, and that the feedback that we do get is that. You know, the, this is as good as what you can get sure. from sort of the best uh, champagne houses um, in France. And, uh, you know, I think it's not just about what people say and what mark. It's not marketing talk. It's it's the reality. It's it's beautiful. I mean, I remember when I tasted sort of my first sort of French champagne, you got yeah. that biscuity sort of creaminess to it, you know, and now that's exactly what we're getting from the top South African uh, Yeah, for sure. And I producers. think there's a lot of the sort of like um, chalkiness that we're also finding in our yeah. things and, and it really draws you closer to champagne um, for me and my personal sort of opinion. So. Yeah. From a, Look, from uh, a wine... Oh, Dan, just I mean, you remember, when I, remember when I sprayed you with that uh, Lomeron's uh, Brut the last time, you know? <laughs> Can you remember that? I can. I, th I think I just shot sixty-five at the old course, and uh, you'd sign for a hundred and three. In terms of, if, if I'm having a look at the bottle, part part of what we try and do, uh, as you both well know on the show, is uh, uh, is show people a little bit about an industry that maybe they're not that familiar with. Uh, there is no year on it, so it's not a particular vintage. Uh, Non-vintage is what we call it. Uh, you always talk about vintage champagne. Uh, Non-vintage, what does that actually mean, Gareth? And is it inferior? Is it different? Does it have certain qualities? What does that say to me when I'm looking at a bottle that's non-vintage versus one with a year on? Yeah, I, I think um, non-vintage is always not considered an um, inferior product. I just think is what non-vintage ma um, makes us able to blend from different years. And so it's not one specific year. Um, in theory, a lot of people say vintage is better, and in some cases it is. But uh, I wouldn't be worried if it said non-vintage. Um, to know what it does is, in like these big champagne houses, they allow to blend from different years, so they keep the consistency of what they put into the bottle um, the same. And um, that's where um, these, um, you know, master blenders get involved, and um, what a lot of the guys do. So I think, generally speaking, a lot of non-vintage bubbles in your bigger portfolio makes up 75 to you know 80 percent and your vintage is really 20 percent of your, your your volume you know um and usually they're slightly bit more priced um but yeah um i, I wouldn't say all non-vintages are inferior to um some of the top end stuff that's an important point to make. I really like wine. Uh, you mentioned master blenders. We've got a few of them watching. Uh, Peter Ferreira is watching. Says, nice to see you all. Mr. Bubbles, the uh, the king of Cup Classique here in South Africa, Peter. Uh, lovely to, to have you on. And Gary Baumgarten, who's head of security down at Antony Rupert Vayner, uh, raising a glass. <laughs> Uh, and also uh, Ilana Bernhardt uh, saying, well done, Gary Robertson and Ruben. Uh, Ilana joining us as well. Lovely to have you on, Ilana. Um, I was going to fire off a question there to Ruben, but I think he preempted it. I was going to ask him if he needed to get off and get uh, attending to his steak, uh, but I think he's sent off to see how the fire is because that's what we do. Uh, steak and syrup, but at a very simple level, red meat plus red wine is quite a thick equation and it's one that appeals uh, to those of us who don't fall into the, the vegetarian and vegan category uh, from a slightly more technical perspective though gareth what is it about red wine in general a syrah in particular that speaks to a steak so perfectly and and creates that beautiful partnership yeah i think it's always a, a big debate when you're saying what the perfect match is everyone's preference is, is different but um, what I really abide, uh, I'm, Shiraz is my definitely my favorite um, red variety. And what I find about it is South Africa can produce some uh, the most amazing Syrah or Syrah based blends. Um, and, and yeah, I just think for me personally, what I like about um, Syrah and or Shiraz 
as a, as a pairing partner with steak is that you're able to get amazing sort of um, attractive aromas. Um, so from a peel, um, it's really nice. And then with the actual wine, you know, um, Shiraz, you can make in different styles, so very refined um, and very finesse, or the guys can make these big sort of heavy wines that can really take on any um, cut of meat, you know, in my own humble opinion. Um, what I like about our Rebex Rafir um, Syrah is that it's, it's a more of a, a, refine, a refined sort of um, wine with um, some amazing sort of um, firm tannins. And I think what the tannins are um, in red wine that actually really help it pair to, um, with meat and, and especially able to cut through that slight sort of, um, sort of creaminess or that fattiness in it. And that's for me personally why I like about um, Syrah. Um, and then also some fruit to really back it up. Uh, another question from a technical perspective. I asked you the one about vintage versus non-vintage. Syrah versus Shiraz. If I take my wife, for example, give her a bottle of Shiraz, she loves it. Give her a bottle of Syrah, she'll probably hit you with it. Uh, are they different grapes? Is it simply the style? What is the difference between a Syrah and a Shiraz? Yeah, my understanding is is um, it's definitely the same. It's tomato, tomato, um, the nice sort of argument. But... Um, that does go um, deeper in that. You know, a couple of years ago when I was in the States, you know, Syrah is supposedly more the refined style, um, much more leaner um, and very European. So towards uh, more the sort of um, the South of France um, style of wine. So um, a bit more old school. And then um, Shiraz was really, the Aussies have really coined it. And um, to be much bolder up front, um, a lot more fruit, you know, um, and a lot more powerful, um, lots of oak. Um, and, yeah, in the States, when I was there, you know, Shiraz, the varietal, it's the same varietal, but um, we're selling three times to Syrah. Um, but when you, it's quite confusing because in, in California, you can go and pick up a Syrah, which is 15% alcohol, and um, this blockbuster, which I would have definitely put it in the Shiraz camp. So um, from our side, um, the Na'ara Syrahs that we're making, a lot more the refined Syrahs um, and a lot more finesse. And that's why, hence, we go with that um, instead of Shiraz. All right. So it's the most uh, semantic than anything else. Uh, I, see, uh, I see Mr. Bubbles is commenting, first up, that it's about exploring, as there's no right or wrong with food and wine pairing. And I definitely agree with you. If you like something together, then it's definitely the right one. But also, thanks for our Shiraz. Gareth hits the nail on the head. If Professor Bubbles is saying you've got it right, Gareth, then uh, that's a big, big tick in your particular box. <laughs> from the general discussion to the... <laughs> Uh, and and this Syrah, but before we try it, it is the uh, the Ribex Profair from the Cape of Good Hope range. Uh, let's talk terroir rather than wine first up, and Scotland because there's not just South Africa. I'm not sure in the world right now there is a more exciting winemaking spot, winemaking region than the Scotland as the 200 pointers from Tim Atkin to Ibn Sadi and Kali Lowe with uh, Skip Berg and the Porta Laneberg illustrated last week, uh, the uh, the decision to go out there to take advantage of that space, I've got land out there, what what inspired it and, and how rewarding do you feel that move has been? Yeah, so um, it's um, when Johan Rupert um, took over um, um, from his um, late brother, um, he wanted to produce some of the best wines in South Africa. And on his quest um, with the assistance um, of uh, Rosa Kruger, um, who was our viticulturist at the time, and Ivan Sadi, um, they managed to come across this property on the Rebex Rafi Road, so behind um, a Rebex Castile on the Castile Bay uh, Mountains. They found this property, and um, what was really extraordinary about it was really the soils. Um, you know, they have this sort of schist and shale sort of soils on the slopes of the Castile Bay, and literally the district dirt road cuts it in half, and on the on the southern slopes, we've got this just pure clay soils. So I think, um, you know, Syrah is really one of those varieties that does extremely well in the Swatlands. And um, for me, it's very similar to the south of France. Um, and what I thought was amazing was um, Mr. Rupert found, um, saw this um, opportunity and then purchased this farm, which has got some very old Chenin Blanc and then also some um, Cinso on it. And then really replanted the different clones of Syrah 
um, on the slopes. And um, it was really textbookly done. Um, you know, we used different trellising methods where we, we used the Eschela or stake vine sort of method on these slopes, um, which is, um, you know, closer plantings more. Um, and we really find that that really works for us. So in the bigger scheme of things, I think Swatland is Sarah country, um, Shiraz. Um, you know, we can also see of Kali and what Yevon do. Um, and that's what, um, you know, we started doing. And um, what I think has happened is this little road of Rebek, um, refill is started to become so popular due to the um, due to the soils that it has there. So now our neighbours are Malinu, and then further up on the right is Bukenotes Gold Mine, and then further down the road is Leon Kells, um, some of their vineyard blocks. So I think from our side, um, you know, it's amazing terroir, and there's some amazing wines coming out, and this Rebex Refill Syrah is just one of them um, at a really good price. It is indeed. I had a look at the price on the to make sure I hadn't got it wrong. It's a wine that we're going to be pairing with some steak. Uh, if I can ask you to look out the window, uh, how's, how's Ruben going? Has he got his steak on the fire? Uh, yeah, I see that um, um, he's got a lot of smoke coming out there, so I'll, I'll try and um, um, get over there now to show you. But um, I'm burning the steaks, Dad. Finish up. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it, yeah. I'll tell you why I'm a bit worried, Gareth, because I know how these top chefs work. But Ruben hasn't made a meal in a restaurant for 10 years. He plays golf all day, and then he arrives at his restaurant where 17 sous chefs do everything for him, and then he nods and smiles <laughs> and takes all the credit. So he's making a meal for the first time in who knows how long. Yeah, he's definitely under pressure here. So um, I think um, <laughs> we're going to definitely inspect later. But... Um, yeah, so we've, um, what is quite interesting, we got some of our Fredericksburg um, Wagyu, which is grown on the Lomra um, estate. And um, we um, took it through to our, our local butcher, Hudu Herp, who does an amazing job um, with the meats. And definitely if you're in the area, to go and um, shop there and get um, get your, your braai um, goodies for Heritage Day. And um, yeah, so I'll hand over to Ruben. He's going to run through what he's doing with the steak and um, how he's doing it. And um, once we sort of doing that, I'll, I'll do some more of, and we can start tasting the wine. All right, I'm going to have a, 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 a let's uh, rope in Mr. Riffle. No, he's got no interest in me. He's gone straight back to his fire. All right, as he. Uh, as he uh, well, uh, we'll let Gareth uh, take it out. It's a, it, it's a slightly different broadcast tonight. We're trying to do a, a live outside broadcast on Dan Really Likes Wine and combine the wine and the steak and uh, and see how it goes. And uh, so far, so good, certainly from a wine perspective. And I'm about to try out this uh, particular Syrah. So there we go. We've got uh, we've got the Coles. We've got the Wagyu. Uh, Ruben Ripple, talk us through what's happening there. Hey, Dan. Okay, so the nice thing is, Dan, the nice thing is that we're actually getting uh, this beautiful uh, Wagyu from uh, Frederick, Fredericksburg from uh, Lomerans. Um, it's a sirloin, nice uh, thick cut steak. Uh, I, when it comes to steak, Dan, I don't like to put too much on it. It's not been marinated, especially if you have this type of quality. So just salt and pepper. I think whenever you, um, for me especially, if I set my braai up, I like to have sort of a warm section to it and a, a cooler section. So the warm section is to just seal it off quickly. I've got salt and pepper on there, so a mix of green pepper, black pepper, and salt. Uh, quite a bit of lemon juice. Uh, and then I start on the hot section. So with Wagyu especially, you do get a you do quite, get quite a bit of fat on it. So you'll get some flare ups like when you when you brying a, a lamb chops, you normally uh, get a bit of flare up of flames. But um, with steak, it's actually quite good because that kind of we call it flame licking of the steak is exactly what you want. It gives you that nice smoky taste. Steaks normally especially the thickness that we have, you don't want it to stay on the braai for too long because I like a bit of smokiness, but I cook it to medium rare normally. Um, and then I let it rest to go to sort of like uh, more uh, medium pink. Uh, I season my steak before the time. I don't put oil on it and then salt. It's basically salt. 
And you can do that 10 minutes be before you put it onto your braai. Uh, whoever is telling you to only season once it's on the braai or if you do pan roasting, I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> so, uh, so, so no, no oil at all, Reuben? No, first it's first salt and pepper, and then you can yeah. put a little bit of oil on. Very little bit. And please, yeah. Dan, no olive oil. You're not going to put olive oil on a steak when you put it onto your braai. So a little bit of neutral oil like canola or something. I know you make a lot of money, but you don't need to waste your money on spending it on olive oil and then onto the braai, Dan. It, it's a waste of money. So a little bit of neutral oil canola just to, um, uh, you know, that's basically so the steak doesn't stick to the, the grid, especially if you start with a high temperature. Um, but start with, with seasoning. So salt and pepper, as simple as that. Um, I don't know if uh, our beautiful camera lady can maybe show what the steak's, steak looks like on the grill. Oh, they're looking fabulous. Uh, the, the last time I had a steak in France, Ruben was actually at Gareth Robertson's house, and he'd marinated his steak in tomato sauce and mayonnaise. Uh, I didn't really <laughs> think that. Would you recommend that? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> no, definitely not. I think he got sort of uh, uh, the wrong sort of Greek South African mix recipe. Uh, I don't know. Maybe that was a Google. You know, Google gives you really bad recipes, so be careful. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, before we go back to Gareth on the wine, Ruben, talk to us about wine because uh, it's a space you're very passionate about, as you've shown on this show on a, a number of occasions. Uh, steak and red wine sounds like a nice, simple combination. From the chef's perspective, what is it for you that says red wine in general and Syrah in particular is made for the partnership with steak? Look, Dan, uh, I think any chef that really enjoys, um, obviously, his wine uh, would want wine that goes well with not just one specific dish or in terms of how you cook it. You know, we can talk about uh, red meat or fish or chicken, but it really, it's really about how it's cooked. And I really enjoy wines that um, can go with more than one type of dish. Um, and, you know, this old adage of red wine only goes with uh, red meat uh, and white wine only goes with fish. It's, it, you know, those days I think are gone. And now, like, look at this beautiful Syrah, for example. I think we do have this um, approach to sort of Cabernet is really for full bodied uh, or, or normally for steak. But I think Syrah, especially when you start playing around with it or when you add spice to it, Syrah is actually perfect to go with a steak. Uh, and Dan, I like for us to go back to where we make steak. It's like a sense of occasion. You know, it's uh, if you have a good wine um, and a good steak, it should be like an occasion. It's not something that you have every day. And I, I know you do, but I mean, uh, you know, us lesser folk, it's not like we have it every day, you know. So we have to enjoy it. As if it's uh, you know a kind of like a once a month type of occasion, and um, I like a good full-bodied red wine, and I think for this steak especially, I'm sorry you can't taste it. I hope you enjoy your cheese sandwiches, but I mean, this, the the steak with a Syrah is just going to be perfect today. I, I see Peter Ferreira commenting that uh, Dan, we should invest in Smellovision. Uh, I'm not sure if that technology is quite with us yet. Uh, but as soon as we have it, Mr. Ferreira, we will definitely include it. And uh, uh, just to correct you there, Ruben, I don't have steak every night. I uh, have lobster and salmon some evenings in between. So <laughs> get a little bit of balance. Uh, Gareth, back to you on, on that steak. It's looking fabulous. We know the Wagyu's got that richness. Uh, it's got that marbling to it. And so that Syrah, not just complementing it, but also offsetting some of that richness slightly. And you've, you've got the wine that's just a little bit smoother, a little bit more elegant. It's uh, I'd imagine it's going to cut through a bit of that marbling quite nicely. Yeah, 100%. And I think that, and that's what I like about the Revex Refuser uh, is um, it's got some firm tannins. And, you know, that's really with these um, Frederick Pittsburgh Wagyu steaks. It's just really going to cut through that sort of fat as well and just make it um, one plus one equals almost three, you know. Um, and, um, and I just like the elegance of the wine. That's really going to complement the steak. 
All right. Well, what I'll ask you to do as soon as that steak is ready is to, to have a bite of it and give us a, a very objective assessment of the Reuben Riffle Wagyu Sirloin. Is it is it almost coming off the grill there, Reuben? Yeah, Dan, we're going to uh, just to sort of um, uh, make you salivate a little bit more. I'm going to take take one off quickly and then I'll sort of... Um, yeah, let's... I'll sort of glaze it. To, let me just take my other steaks off, you know. Rise. <laughs> and are you resting those, Ruben? Are you giving them a little bit of time before you cut them open? Yeah, so they need to, they're going to rest for about uh, five to eight minutes. And then we're going to cut them. But like I said, just to get you salivating, I'm going to cut one, up, one open now. And you can do that if you're going to eat it quickly. You know, it's. Normally, us South Africans, we like to eat off the bra as well. So we'll take this one as a bit of an oopsie. <laughs> an oopsie is where, you, you know, the, the little bits that fall to the side and you can quickly <laughs> eat them. So, Dan, this is the one. Let's look at it. Right. So this is a so, Reuben hand cooked. Uh, what have you got to go with it there, Reuben? So this is a, a brown butter with some roasted mushrooms, thyme, and roasted garlic that I'm just going to put over it. Ah, and uh, uh, what, what, what's that doing to the wine pairing? Is it going to change it dramatically? Yeah, not at all. There's no, you know, there's, it's basically just the mushrooms, earthies, earthiness. So garlic, it's got that earthiness. So we cooked it a little bit before the time to take the, the sharpness out. The mushrooms are just sort of roasted a little bit in olive oil and then some thyme. So that's just really nice earthy flavors that I think, Garrett yeah. would go perfectly with it with a syrah as well, and this is just a little wine uh, sauce to go with it. Ah, oh, look at that! Internationally acclaimed. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now we're gonna take. I'm trying to work out what the travel time is from Johannesburg to Franschhoek, but I fear it might be a little too long. Ah, oh, fabulous! Look at that pedal. I'll fan it out a little bit, so nice, medium rare. Ah, terrific. The mm. other thing, Dan, is when it, when it comes to steak brying, you've got to feel like you're over-salting it in the beginning or over-seasoning it because seasoning is super important. You want that sort of um, deep umami flavor. If, if it's too bland, it doesn't really go with the wine. So let's yeah. taste. Um, let's do it while Dan's here so you can... Um, yeah. You can... Uh, Celebrate. Uh, Celebrate. Sorry. As you're watching that, that's not actually Ruben's swimming pool. That's his Norwegian salmon pond, uh, which he removes <laughs> me from each day. Uh, Gary, honest opinion, how's that steak? Gee, it's, it's amazing. It's just like melting in your mouth there. Yo, mm. yo. All right, let's, let's try a retake and go with, Dan, he's overdone it. It's horrible. You're missing nothing. It'll make me feel a little better. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely got that wrong, yeah. It's done to perfection now. And, and what about the wine? Because you've had a, a couple of mouthfuls of this Syrah beforehand. Is that wine changing dramatically in the aftermath of the first mouthful of steak? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I almost expected the steak to be a little bit more um, fatter in the sense that it, um, that maybe the wine, I was a bit nervous that the wine wouldn't stand up. But I think it actually works out perfectly because it's not too fatty. Um, and there's enough sort of tannins to cut in there and it really balances it out for me. Ruben, are you happy? Dan, I think, you know, uh, I'm not a big fan of, uh, of having steak with sort of creamy sauces or anything. This is the smokiness that you're getting yeah. off the brine. You get that earthiness of the mushrooms and the garlic. And I think it's actually, you know, the, the wine really works well with it. It's not just yeah. the one dimensional with the, pep, the pepperiness yeah. of it, yeah. but it's almost bringing out that creaminess of, you know, the texture of the steak. Yeah. And also from that region, often uh, the Syrahs that you get, there's a, a slight minerality to it um, that I find. And, um, you know, with the, obviously the, the sauce and stuff like that, you spoke about earthiness. It really does ma uh, marry very well. Hmm. I see Chantelle Johansson commenting there. It sounds delicious. Uh, Chantelle, it looks delicious. And I have no doubt it actually is delicious. I'm just enormously envious that I'm here. And 
Uh, having made such a schoolboy error, never again will I allow a chef to cook food on the show when I'm not standing beside him or her. Uh, so you've got a great combination. You've got that done. Uh, Ruben, one last piece of advice. People are getting ready for Heritage Day. For those people for whom Heritage Day is a day to, to get a steak done, uh, any final golden rule from you to make sure you get it just right? Well, Dan, um, very simple. I think you have to start with good quality. Make sure that you buy the best quality uh, steak. I always go with, uh, when Gareth asked me, I, you know, the size is sort of like my fingers. It's two fingers um, yeah, in terms of the thickness. Uh, because if it goes too thick, the steak sort of like tends to dry out and the, the, the sides of it as well. The important thing is, a steak is about caramelizing the outside and then you work on the temperature on the inside. And please stay away from crazy bastings and, and too long marinating. And if you, have to, if you have to tenderize a steak, change your butcher. <laughs> uh, well, uh, this is an important tip for Gareth because I'm going to be around at his house in a couple of weeks' time for a bride. Yeah, so, no, I appreciate um, that. He's making something spectacular. Uh, Gareth, a uh, uh, last word from you before we confirm the com uh, the competition uh, on this particular wine on this Syrah. It's it's five years old now. I think it's drinking beautifully at the moment. And um, just your your last thoughts on on, on why this for you is. is such a particularly nice wine. Yeah, I'm um, Dan. Yeah, I just think um, it's one of our, our, our new releases that we released this year, and I think the winemakers did an amazing job um, of producing it. And um, I think if it's not our Syrah of Rebex for free, um, try something like that because I think a, a lot of our Syrahs that we make in South Africa are going to be great, are great fits. And um, enjoy Heritage Day. We certainly will. We won't let you go just yet because let's remind you of our competition, which is Dan Really Likes Wine, partnering up with Antonio Rupert Vayner. And this is it. If you missed it at the start of the show, you have the chance to win one of four cases of Good Hope of Ibex Lafayette Syrah from the Swatland. All you have to do is follow both Dan Really Likes Wine and Antonio Rupert Wine and to do so on Facebook and on Twitter. Uh, use the hashtag Steak and Syrah, and the winners will be announced next week on Heritage Day. And that is a fabulous, fabulous case of wine that will be heading your way. So, uh, uh, Gareth, thank you. It's a very generous prize from you, and we're very grateful for it. It'll be four extremely lucky winners. Uh, and, uh, yeah, they can, uh, happy Heritage Day to everybody. Thank you very much for both the bubbles and for the wine and for roping in Reuben as well. And uh, enjoy the, the week building up to mastering that steak next Thursday. Thanks so much, Daniel. I really appreciate it. And thanks, Ruben, for um, thanks. frying those steaks so well and um, for joining up in this, um, trying to make the perfect combination. But thanks a lot. <laughs> All right. Two great combinations. Steak and Sparrow is one. Gareth Robertson and Ruben Riffler are another. In fact, if you want a final great combination, uh, try Angelique and Dimitra Kuvalakis, who've just logged on. Uh, my gorgeous wife and her beautiful sister-in-law, who are watching Glass of Wine in Hand and cheering on go the Greeks. And the Greeks will be part of my household celebration next Thursday when we have a leg of lamb in the oven to celebrate the Greek side, a beef and Guinness pie to celebrate my Irish origins, and lots and lots of South African wine for the country we live in, we call home, and we love dearly. So that is almost the end of the show, but not quite, because right at the start I told you that we have got a really special guest next week. Now this is a guest I've been trying to get on the show for oh, months and months and months. And he watches the show regularly. In fact, he's watching the show at the moment, but he is proper royalty and it's a real process. You've got to go through all sorts of loops and barriers to get through to him. But we've got him, we've got his wine. And so next Monday, it is one guest and one guest only as we present the ultimate Peter Bubbles Ferreira Masterclass in Cup Classic. We've got eight bottles. We're going to be trying every single one of them. We're going to have a hell of a night afterwards. But what this says for me is get online, tell your friends about it. This will explain to you why South African Cup Classic for me is every bit as good 
as French champagne and why what we're doing here in South Africa is absolutely world beating. It's the Graham Beck range, the range that Barack Obama had his inauguration dinner and Peter Ferreira just has an alchemy when it comes to bubbles. He does something with them that is extraordinary and you'll see me enjoying the results as I'm sure you will have over time with a bottle of Graham Beck when we get to the show on Monday night. So uh, Peter Ferreira in uh, advance, thank you for joining us on Monday. We can't wait to have you on. Uh, in the interim, remember that competition. You've got a week to go to post your picture of Steak and Syrah, Steak and Shiraz. Use that hashtag Steak and Syrah. Follow ourselves, follow Antony Rupert Vayner, and we look forward to giving away four cases of that brilliant wine this time next week. Have a terrific weekend. Thanks again to the Shannon Blanc Association and Standard Bank for the launch we hosted a little earlier today online. It was a great success and some terrific feedback with 10 wonderful winners from eight different estates paying rich tribute to Shannon Blanc in South Africa. I'll see you back again on Monday evening. Enjoy your weekend. Keep drinking South African wine. And remember, if you're not already, join that Pick and Pay Wine Club. You get three times the smart shopper points. You get 10 different wines with a 20% discount. And you get exposed to some fabulous South African wine. And as we say every single week, South African wine really is the best in the world. Have a great evening. Good night. Cheers.